JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab created or earth created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict free stones. Then you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real time diamond consultations available where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. You've discovered your link to gopowercat.com's PowerCat podcast. Now, here's your host, gopowercat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to the PowerCat Insiders Podcast, your Monday podcast from GoPowerCat.com. I am Tim Fitzgerald, joined by Matt Walters, my sidekick, Ryan Gilbert of the GoPowerCat staff, and our basketball analyst, Jay Heydrich, as we talk about K-State sports, K-State basketball, and we'll get into plenty of that. But first, we are sponsored by Blue Mark Energy. Does your company or your employer spend $4,000 or more a year on energy bills? Would you like to reduce those costs by 25% or more and maintain the same level of service and reliability? If so, it's time to speak with Blue Mark Energy. Blue Mark Energy, K-State owned and K-State proud. This is going to primarily be a basketball edition of the Insiders. But Matt, I want to start here. Darren Sproles into the College Football Hall of Fame. We knew it was coming, but wow, this this guy is so deserving. It is Really cool, and I just saw that K State released a video when they told him about his induction. And uh, he, what a likable guy Darren has always been, and so deserving. One of the all-time greats, uh, a guy that, for the most part, and I, I say this somewhat tongue-in-cheek, a guy that let his play <laughs> speak for itself. Darren was not a guy that really liked to talk to the media, and you know when he got into the NFL, that changed, and he became a lot better at. But just absolutely thrilled. For him, I remember all, I'll never forget the buzz around him and those Olathe North teams of Gene Weir, you know, back in the day, I, I got to watch and, and call a game with with Darren and Olathe North playing against Manhattan High uh, in the state championship game years ago. But, you know, just a, a lovable guy and, and could not be happier for Darren and his family. That's yeah, really cool. Gills, how much do you remember at your young age here, your tender age? How much do you remember of Darren Sproles? I can't say I remember ever watching him um, <laughs> play. I know I had a jersey that my dad got. Um, it was a Darren Sproles jersey, but I don't think I ever got – I don't think I remember seeing him play. But certainly growing up in the NFL, he was always fun to watch for sure. What? How old were you when you got this jersey approximately? Uh, four or five. I don't know. It was so probably – Maybe. It was probably his actual size jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's turn our attention now to basketball. And Jay, Saturday was so painful. Kansas State loses to Oklahoma State 70 to 54. But I say it was painful not because of uh, how they played. I, I give credit to the guys that played the game. I mean, what can you say? Uh, you go into a college basketball game with six scholarship players. You have to play a walk-on who, honestly, I don't think was ever intended to play unless it was pure mop-up uh, minutes. And and there he was. He was out there playing. Um, even against Oklahoma State, a team that you might be able to compete with, this was a mismatch. It the, This six-player rule by the Big 12 that you got to play if you got six scholarship players, it stinks. It's not fair to the players, not fair to the fans, but by God, the athletic directors get to cash the TV money, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is just one of those things where this isn't the last we've seen of this, unfortunately, too. Um, I think you're going to see this potentially, obviously, with K-State moving forward as COVID continues to uh, spread across our area, but also with uh, the other teams as well. So, on the downside of it, yeah, it, it was hard on Saturday, and the kids fought and did an excellent job, particularly on Cade Cunningham. But, you know, the, the bright side of it is that this might be a way for K-State to steal a couple. You know, they, they might, you know, if they go into uh, someplace where they're not expected to win and, and COVID – uh, similarly affects a, a team like uh, KU or Oklahoma or Texas or some other school down the road, you know, this might be a way for K-State to, uh, um, to, to steal one. I think the, the short sightedness of it is we're seeing it with the college football playoff in particular, it's better to not play 
than it is to play and lose. So from the conference's standpoint, you know, if KU and Texas lose a couple games because of COVID, because they had six scholarship players and they mo- they moved off that one or two seed line for the NCAA tournament, um, that has potential ramifications for the conference. And so I, I think that there, there's just a lot of things that maybe look good on the front side that looking back that maybe you, you, you they might want to look at adjusting potentially. Well, as soon as it happens to someone else, they might look at it. But K-State had to play. Matt, you were there. K-State hung tough for, I haven't really looked at it, but like the first three quarters of both halves. I bet you K-State won those, uh, and, you know, in total. But when you get into the last five minutes of each half, when the guys were really tired, Oklahoma State pulled away in both halves, and particularly at the end when I, they hit something like 13 straight or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, their last third. Yeah, it was just awful to watch. I mean, it was you feel bad for the kids, but they kept fighting. Yeah, the Oklahoma State had its last 13 shots, and, you know, for really about 30 minutes, uh, K-State played, you know, pretty well, all things considered. Um, you know, I thought I thought I would – I thought I thought we would see some more from Oklahoma State, and, you know, I, I – God bless Joe Petrakis. I can imagine just how amped up he was when, you know, he was he was summoned to the scores table. And um, you know, one thing he'll he'll say and be able to tell his grandkids down the road is, you know, we once had to play Oklahoma State incredibly shorthanded, and and um, I outscored a likely number one <laughs> draft pick in the NBA draft because he outscored Kate Cunningham six to five, but you know, it's, it, it's not fair. I mean, K-State or any team you should, I think you should have eight scholarship players as opposed to the, the six, you know, K-State did some good things, but what was even, you know, what was even more difficult is when you don't have your point guard right. uh, and, and not having Nigel Pack now for, you know, a couple of games is, is going to be difficult. Um, you know, kudos to the kids. I didn't hear really any complaining or griping. You know, they got out there, they competed, and, uh, you know, just eventually ran out of gas and got worn down. I want to talk about Joe Petrakis in a little bit, but, Gills, you were there also. And how comical did that bench area look? I mean, they have all these chairs set up, scattered about, and there's three guys on the bench during the game. In fact, I texted you and asked – we're the walk-ons there because the camera angle, you couldn't even see anyone but one person on the bench. It was just crazy. Yeah, during this COVID season, it's all, you know, it's weird to look at that bench, but even with the limited numbers, uh, certainly was was odd to see, you know, happy for Petrakis. I mean, every game you you can, it's, 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 it's easy if you're a walk-on to act like you care and, you know, clap your hands and be engaged. But Joe is always calling out, you know, uh, here comes a ball screen, you know, here comes a high low, you know, he knows the scouting report. He knows what's going to come. He's helping out his team, you know, day in and day out every game. So, you know, I was really happy to see him get in. And like you said, Matt outscore, you know, the, the top, you know, one of the top players in the country um, in his class, but certainly it's frustrating, man, that they didn't get uh, to have this game postponed, you know, this morning, West Virginia had one uh, positive case and they're postponing their game tomorrow. Um, so they have one and we have what seven players out and we have to play our game or K-State has played their game. So that doesn't make much sense to me. I know it's, it's, it's a little different because it was a positive, but still, I think that this, the standard needs to be the same here for, for every team, you know, one, you know, positive has to equal seven players being out for Kansas state. So they, they fought their tails off, man, but I said it, you know, they simply ran out of gas when you only have, you know, let's be real here, six players essentially in that game, you're going to run out of gas when it's that long of a matchup. Jay, if anyone can relate to Joe Petrakis, it is Jay Heidrich. You're perfect for this topic, brother. Perfect. Um, And I say this because you were the guy that went to practice, put in all the work, did a lot of scout team stuff with really a limited expectation of, you know, how much playing time you would get. But to be thrust into the situation he was Saturday, I don't think you can ask much more for a kid. I mean, he put in six points, hit a three-pointer, um, and, uh, you know, did adequately well defending, rebounding. He just kind of is in the right place. 
doing the right thing because that's his job in practice. How, from your standpoint, how cool was this? It was awesome. I mean, it was great. You know, I, it, it, it's hard to be a walk on because you just, you go get beat up every day and you don't get any of the, um, uh, notoriety on Saturdays or on Wednesdays. But, you know, if, if you accept that role, you know, it is something that you're proud when your team does well, because it, you have, it, you know, I, at least me personally, I, I always took a, a, uh, an approach of, and I've used this with my, with my kids teams that everyone on a team has a role. Not all roles are equal, but all roles are important. And so my role was to, go out and practice every week and get the other guys on my team ready for games on Saturdays um, and, and and do what I could do in that regard, then help however I could on that. And when you accept that role, then when you have success or you go out and you see your team do well, um, then, then, then that's great. It's even better when you get to be a part of it in which Joe got to be too. But we've seen this before with Austin Budke, you know, a few years ago too, he was thrust into, into action as well, as well. And Austin did a great job. Joe is at least, you know, physically more suited more than Austin was, or I was to, to go play in the, in the post from a, a physical attribute standpoint. But, you know, it, 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 I'm just really happy for Joe to be able to do that. He went out and, and, uh, uh, and, and did it. it you know, my, my question is moving forward. Everyone talks about um, the, the, the effect on the games. And it is a huge effect on the games as we saw, but, you know, Ryan, you talked about, you know, on the scout team and doing those things, how are you going to scout moving forward? How are you going to have kids in practice come in and run, you know, the, the Texas uh, scout offense or the Oklahoma scout offense or Iowa state or whatever. Um, you know, we, we had kind of a similar issue. My first year at Martin County was we had the second semester with eight players. And so we had to have, um, uh, you know, managers come in and just to go five on five on practice in practice. And so, what you're going to run into the challenge for the staff will be to have practices where they can get meaningful things done uh, in a way that doesn't overly tax the, um, the, the physical tiredness the players are obviously ex- experiencing and the injuries as well, but also be able to get something out of it. So you're ready to play. Yeah, exactly. Matt. And they came out of Saturday's game beaten up. I mean, days Gordon turned an ankle. Honestly, if they have a, you know, a normal number of players. I don't know how much he plays, but he played 39 minutes, somehow got a double-double, gimping around almost the entire second half. And um, Carlton Lingard has back issues. Salton McGill was cramping up. I'm really curious. I don't know if they'll have enough guys to go. I don't think they'll meet the sixth threshold for Wednesday night's game with Iowa State, nor do I think they should based on exactly what Gill said. Other teams are backing out based on the criteria that we have a COVID positive, so maybe the whole team's positive, so we're not going to play. I think Bruce needs to err on the side of uh, what's best for his team, and that's not to play this game because I want to make a point here. This is the most winnable game K-State has left in its season, and they, he he deserves – his team deserves the best shot possible to, to win that game. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, and we'll see. It's not, it's not going to surprise me in the least if K-State and Iowa State don't play – on Wednesday night, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about the physical play on Saturday, that's one thing. And that, that may be number one on my list as to what I was most proud of with K-State because K-State, I thought was very physical with Cade Cunningham. I thought they, they did a nice job on him. I, I don't know if mentally he was quite into the game as he is most nights. That's the first time he had not been in double figures uh, all year he'd had five games of 20 or more, but you know, whether it was McGurl, whether it was Dejuan, you know, they, they didn't give him anything easy. They were checking him. It was not easy for him to get through the lane, uh, whatever the case. Now, with that said, one of the other, one of the other keys was to not let some of the, the quote unquote other guys hurt you. And unfortunately that happened. I mean, I think everybody expected that likely and, and Cunningham would get theirs, but there were some other guys that stepped up. And, uh, boy, I tell you what, what, uh, what Oklahoma State was a couple of years ago is a lot different than what they are now. And I'm not saying that Oklahoma State is Baylor or Texas, but athletically, they're not, they're not far behind. I mean, they are long and can, 
can defend. Um, you know, I don't think they're a great offensive team by any stretch, but there, you know, there were some positive things that K-State did on Saturday. And, you know, I, I, I made mention during the broadcast early on that this could be, this could be like a Hoosiers game where my team's on the floor. I was a little worried when K-State got into some foul trouble. There might be four dudes out there uh, at some point who would think we would ever, ever see something like that in a Big 12 game. It's absurd. It's it's silly that you even have to consider that, but they're getting pretty close to that. They did on Saturday. Gills, he, he brought up the job that K-State did on Cade Cunningham, and I think he's right. I, I think Matt's exactly right. He wasn't very engaged. He didn't seem very interested. But I kind of thought early in that game, Sultan Miguel played a role in making Cade Cunningham disinterested. These two know each other from the prep ranks in the Florida Independent High School Leagues. They they kind of been around each other in AAU. I felt like Selton understood his game, where he wants to get his points from, and, and did a good job of taking it away. I would say it's a little bit of both there. Um, I was texting you during the game, Fitz, that you know, we both kind of agreed that Cunningham doesn't look like he's the number one rated freshman in America. Um, I think that it's – I don't think he's – not bought in, but when you have that um, and you're playing on the road against a team who's, you know, what, five and eight on the season, how hard are you going to try? I mean, it should be a cakewalk for you. And I think that, you know, Selton's defense kind of caught him off guard. I want to give Selton credit as well. So it's it's a combination of both of those things, really. Um, Good defense, but also I think Cunningham just really wasn't prepared for this game. Jam fascinated by the amount of attention he gets from announcers, I've watched him, uh, uh, Cade Cunningham, a number of times now, and I'm not impressed. He's casual. Yeah. He takes bad shots. Um, there is an upside to his game. I'm not saying there isn't. But he reminds me as a little bit of a Russell Westbrook in the fact that he all he's really interested in taking his shot, even if it's a bad shot, um, but he doesn't have some of the upside yet that Russ Westbrook offers, I'm not blown away. And people are still talking about him being the one or two pick in the upcoming draft. I don't see it, man. I just don't see it. Well, I, I think you have to view it from the lens of got to be careful that kids set expectations uh, as, as to what they're supposed to be in the NBA drafts on what they're going to be, not what they are. And let's be honest, Kate Cunningham doesn't want to be in school. He doesn't want to be in college. He doesn't want to be in Stillwater right now. So you're going to get nights like you saw a few nights ago from him where he looks like he's checked out. The other danger that you have to be careful of is you know, people always used to talk about Michael Beasley not playing hard and being lazy and, and, and those things. And did he have the moments of that? Sure. But, you know, guys like Kate Cunningham and Michael Beasley make – everything looks so easy that it just looks like they're not trying because they don't have to. Their 80% is better than a hundred percent of basically everybody else in college basketball. And so they're, they're going to do what they need to do to get it done and, and, and move on. But, you know, Selton Miguel did a great job on him when he, when he was guarding them. And, and that is a kid right now that has a real opportunity. Now I'm looking at his line and Selton went, 211 from the field, 204 from three uh, from free throw, 05 from three. He had one rebound um, for six points. Here's an opportunity for a kid like that to step up. You want to be the man? This is your chance. Uh, with his size and his athleticism, he shouldn't have one rebound. Um, he should be able to go and, and make a difference like Rudy, or not Rudy, but like we're seeing with Deshwan. Desh- you know, going and getting boards and tip-ins and, and creating havoc on that. This is a huge opportunity for Selton to step up and and and, and, and assert himself as a we- as a weapon on the K-State offense and use his elite athleticism to, to his advantage, just like he did on the defensive end against Kate Cunningham. Yeah, I agree. I was really disappointed in Selton's play. When you look at how he played in that game, uh, half of his shots, five of the 11, a little under half, came from three-point range. And, Matt, that's not his game. I know he no. wants that to be his game. But, again, just like Dejuan Gordon, you got to understand where your points are coming from. And both of those guys are coming from getting to the rim. Even as Jay points out, it's always to the right with Selden. I'm going to go to the right. He he did go to his left one time and got a basket. I, I fell out of my chair. I'm okay. Um, but, Matt, he needs to do the things, focus on the things where his where he's making his money. 
And his money is made getting to the hoop. And Jay's right. You got to not just defend, you got to rebound. He did have seven assists. I, that, that totally escaped me from the game. That, that's impressive. Uh, but again, I, and I don't want to hammer on the coaches, but they have to make sure these guys are doing what they do best and not getting caught up in trying to shoot the three pointer so much because this team stinks at it. In conference play, K-State is shooting 26.5% from long range. They've taken 117. They've hit 31. Uh, And we've been, you know, we've talked about that for weeks here on this podcast. Um, You know, you're right. There was was that one moment in the game where Selton did go left. uh, And everybody knows he's going right. He's at times a little bit out of control. And, you know, I, I... I just I want to see this team, like you said, Fitz. They understand what they can do and what's maybe outside of their their comfort zone. You know, in in talking with Bruce on the air post game on Saturday, I, I get it. There's frustration. You know, they they feel like they probably should not have even played that game. Two two things I thought going in that would give K State a better chance being outman and underman would, would be to really use the shot clock and to and to get to the basket, aka get to the foul line as well. In case they only shot 12 free throws in the ball game. And you know, K State's not great in the half court, but I thought if K State could shorten the game and utilize a lot of the shot clock, that would give them some opportunities and you know, they, they hung in there. I thought if K-State could get to the last five minutes of the game and be within six or seven, they'd have a chance. You know, and they, they did their thing. And one thing, I don't remember, Jay, if you brought it up or if it was you, Fitz, but from the opening tip, I kept track of what the score was at every media timeout. And in the first half, K-State and Oklahoma State almost, you know, almost split what what it looked like. And then in the second half, Oklahoma State started to get away because Kansas State was getting tired. Um, but K-State has too many scoring droughts. And, and again, I think still takes too many threes. Um, but understanding what you are and what your personality is is, is going to be key for this basketball moving down the road, whether they've got six guys, eight guys, or the full Monty. I want to get more into specific players um, later in this podcast, but before we go to break, I have a odd topic here that I want to bring up, Gills. Um, there's now talk about basketball and NBA in Kansas City. The NBA is looking at expansion. Obviously, Seattle will get a team to replace the Supersonics. I hope they go back to Supersonics. That's what they should be. I'm old. I believe in that. Uh, Kansas and the City, green and yellow uniforms. Absolutely. Go back and just dig up the old school stuff. Don't even order new uniforms. Just go to the storage area and get the old ones. Um, and there's talk about Kansas City being the other team. I am becoming a believer that the what would be really good for the NBA and basketball in the United States is if the NBA would turn that developmental league into the equivalent of AAA baseball or AA, depending on how you look at it, where the prospects go, and every team have a stock of players, and maybe there'll be a group of guys on that team that never will make it go up to the league, but they're you know, the guys that are going to play in Canton or Tulsa or wherever it is. Every team has a AAA team. And these one and dones, Jay and Gills, are done. They don't have to go to college. They don't have to go to college. They can get drafted right out of high school, probably have to expand the draft into a few more rounds, and go play a one year in Canton or wherever and get paid for it. And I bring this up completely selfishly. And first, Gills, I want your opinion. I think that would help K-State basketball. Get these guys out. Get them out. Quit having teams lean on it and make it about developing players from the ground up like Bruce Weber likes to do. If I understand you, you're just saying it would, you know, hurt KU in, in Kentucky and North Carolina, right? Well, in this case, Oklahoma State, too. Yeah. yeah I mean, sounds like a good idea to me, but I think case, Kansas City just needs a, an NBA team straight up. That's, that's, that's all I want. Uh, that, Jay, what are your thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I... I mean, I don't think it's going to help K-State because the 
you know, if, if KU, Kentucky, Duke are getting the one through 50 right now and those kids go to the league, then they're going to get 51 through 100. <laughs> True. And, and it's just going to push everybody down, you know. And, and, and I'm going to take issue with something that you said um, where you said these kids wouldn't have to go to school. Nobody forces these kids to go to college. Um, if, if you know, you see it in soccer, you see it in sports all over. Uh, you know, there, there, there are kids who uh, go overseas for a year and do this. And so you, you know, the rules going into college, uh, we can debate what they should be or what they shouldn't be, but you know, I'm going in and um, to, to walk in and to a situation where you know what they stand um, and then complain about it, then if you don't like it, don't go. Um, uh, and, uh, none of these kids are forced to be here at all. And, you know, if you, you know, I've gone back and forth a lot with, uh, you know, people in, you know, on, on both sides of the issue. And you look at a kid like Zion Williamson that everybody wants to use as an example, you know, yeah, I mean, Zion may Duke a lot of money, but what's an average commercial cost on ESPN? Um, for a 30 second ad and Zion Williams probably spent what 50, hundred hours on ESPN last year. Um, and so what value did Duke provide to him for his brand as a nutritionist, as uh, strength conditioning for all those things as well. And if you don't believe that there's value there, look, what was what's what's the what's the brand recognition and marketing ability between Zion Williamson and John Morant, who went to Murray State, coming out of college. So, if you want to, if you want to compare those as to what going to a school like Duke or KU or North Carolina brings, then let's talk about total value. I'm not saying these kids don't bring value. I'm not saying they shouldn't be paid. I'm not taking a position one way or another on that. I'm just saying that there there is a holistic view that you have to approach. It's not just the kids that are, it's not just the schools that are getting benefit out of this. Folks, that's why Jay has a law degree and I filled out coloring books to get a degree. That's it right there in summary. That's it for the first half of the Powercat Insiders podcast. We'll be back on the other side with more talk about Kansas State sports and Kansas State basketball. The Powercat podcast will be right back. So I'm a father of what? I got to find a babysitter. I found Care.com and I was blown away. Through the platform, I was able to find local and experienced candidates along with their reviews and rates, which were way more affordable than I anticipated. Care.com really put me at ease knowing that they were all required to go through a background check. If you're like me and you need to find someone reliable for your child care necessities, check out Care.com. Find the ideal sitters for your child care needs. Is your January looking dry? Get some lotion, get a humidifier, and better yet, get Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices across local stores to get the best price on a huge selection of drinks perfect for dry January. Every single time. Non-alcoholic wines? Have a look. Ready-made mocktails? Grab a straw and order them up. Beer without the alcohol? (laughs) Yep, take your pick. You can find all of them here, in the app. In that phone, that's in your hand. Could it be any simpler? Nope, not a chance. So shop for great deals on all your dry January beverages or other drinks and get them delivered to your door or blanket fort, maybe. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. And don't forget to lotion up your elbows. They're looking a little dry. We now send it back to the PowerCat Podcast. Welcome back to the PowerCat Insiders Podcast. We're brought to you by Blue Mark Energy, a natural gas products services provider serving feed yards, hospitals, hotels, manufacturers, and school districts throughout the Midwest. And Blue Mark Energy is the natural gas provider for the Kansas State campuses, campuses in Manhattan and Salina. Blue Mark Energy, K State owned and K State proud. When I think of gassy things, I think of Blue Mark. That's for you, Ron, my buddy who owns Blue Mark. Uh, guys, uh, I, this isn't going to get better for KSA. This is what they're going to have to deal with. W- one of you brought up that the, the threshold should be eight players, um, eight scholarship players to play a game, and that's what I thought it should have been. Um, and that's what K-State was playing with heading into this game uh, last Saturday with Oklahoma State when they 
tumbled to four. Uh, and because of that, a lot of guys are getting playing time. And we're seeing guys get real opportunities to prove their worth, including Sari Lewis, who I really didn't expect to play this much, play much at all this season, but has seen action, but then had to miss Saturday's game. But the guy who has really stepped forward for me this season is Dejuan Gordon. And we can all agree he needs to figure out his game a little bit more. But Matt, he continues to get to the rim, and I'll be damned if I can figure out how he makes some of those shots. He is so good going to the rim, getting the ball up on the glass, and getting it over shot blockers. Dejuan has really impressed me. He played Saturday. At, he turned his ankle in the first half, I believe, and still ended up with 14 points, 11 rebounds, and played 39 minutes. This, What's going on this season, even though it's frustrating, even though it's it's probably difficult for the players, I think it's making Dejuan Gordon into a man, and I think that's really good for his final two seasons at Kansas State. As long as he figures out where his points come from, where his game comes from, and starts to live in that restricted area. Your thoughts? Jay talked about roles earlier. Uh, every role is important. Not every role is the same on a basketball team. And, you know, the way I look at it right now is Dejuan is slowly but surely figuring it out, getting to the rim, defending his backside off, and in rebounding is where he really excels. Uh, he took more shots than anybody on Saturday. I don't know that, that that should have been the case, but again, Kansas State was a little shorthanded, so a couple of guys had to take the onus and, uh, and really try to score for the Wildcats. He took six threes. He only hit one. But he's doing a lot more of the little things than he used to. And I think that, uh, I think maybe I said this last week, is Dejuan in year three and year four is going to be a lot different, a lot better than Dejuan in year one and year two. Uh, you know, he's, he's slowly starting to grow up. And he, he, it's... It may not be visible to a lot of people, but I'm sure it is to, to Bruce and the coaching staff and in practice, but he's figuring it out. He still needs to get a little stronger, just a little bit bigger. Uh, but, you know, he had to play through pain with that, you know, that ankle on Saturday. There was just, there was no way around it. And I'm sure he, he was told on the bench, if you can, you have to fight through this and play and suck it up. And, you know, again, to his credit, he did that. Jay, maybe you can come up with a comparison from a previous K-State player for Dejuan. I can't quite grasp it. Uh, you know, the six, four-ish guy who's really athletic, who shouldn't be shooting from the outside, get to the rim, do your work in the lane. I mean, he's not a powerhouse like a David Hoskins. Well, David could shoot the three. Um, but I, I look at a guy from, uh, and they're different builds. I get that. Isaac Likely from Oklahoma State. Here's the point guard, an obvious guard, a you know, a guy out on the court that is out there to lead the team. He so rarely takes three pointers. He knows where his points come from. You know, summing up the day, he did take one against K-State, hit it. It's only his fifth of the year. That's a guy who knows what he does and what he doesn't do and gets it to the rim and dishes the ball out. Actually, he only had one assist in the game. That's kind of shocking. But find your game, man. Zero in on it and do that. And I can't really come up with a comparison to who in K-State history he he plays like. He's so unique in how he should be playing. You know, I I think he's comparable a lot to Rodney Magruder in the sense of how he's starting to attack the boards. You know, one thing when you think back about, he's not the shooter Rodney was, not even close to it, but from the standpoint of attacking the boards, Rodney was a relentless offensive rebounder. In, in that that's one of the things a lot of people don't realize is when you don't have to get the rebound in order to be a disruptor uh, and, and and to create points from from offensive rebounds you know Roddy would, would go and he might get a tip and then somebody else gets the board or someone else you know it, it or he gets a, a foul on a block out you know someone trying to push him uh, out would it, it uh, we talk a lot about on offense moving and making the defense move and being difficult. And this is just another aspect of it. When you stand, you're easy to defend. And one of the things I always hated playing against were guys that would just be relentless to go to the boards, especially super athletic guys, because they were usually 
my size, but they were more athletic and they were strong and they were quick. And I was not any of those things. Um, and so it was just, it was just hard to, to play against those kids. And I hated it. And so I think Deshaun's hopefully going to get the reputation of if you're going to guard Deshaun Gordon, you're, you got your meat, you better bring him up. He's going to make you earn everything you get. And those are things that, you know, on an offense and a team that really, really struggles to create offense, you got to take what you can get. So if you're attacking the boards and you can get a cheap lockout foul, that's one more foul closer you are to the one and one then. You know, if you can get a tip and keep it alive for somebody, that's another possession that you don't have to go down and defend them or you or or you keep the hands out the ball out of the hands of the other team. So I really like what he's doing and, and he he's he's attacking and he's still taking too many threes, but at the same time, too, he, he at least has a, an attacking mindset. You know, my, my problem is not so much the threes you take, but the threes you take that you settle for. And and if you're in the context of an offense and you've moved it around and, and you have an open shot and you're going to take it, great. Um, but I, I don't I don't want him to get into a passive mindset where he's worrying and thinking too much. I want him to keep attacking and doing what he's doing because it's fun to watch right now. I agree. Gills. Um Kansas State took 24 three-pointers. I find this really interesting. They hit six. 24, six out of 24. Oklahoma State took 10 less, and they hit six. Six out of 14. In fact, Oklahoma State took 10 fewer field goals in this game than Kansas State. And you want to point to the free throws, you instinctively, but they only took three more free throws. That tells me Oklahoma State was so much more efficient on the offensive end of how they want to attack the basket. And Selton Miguel and Dejuan Gordon, I think we can all agree. In fact, everyone, I think, would agree on this except Selton Miguel and Dejuan Gordon are not good three-point shooters right now. They were a combined one of 11. One of 11. So as we've mentioned earlier in this podcast, K-State isn't a good three-point shooting team, particularly in the Big 12. If those guys don't take those shots... K-State's 5 of 13 from 3, and that's not bad, and I will take that. Um, Again, please stop taking three-pointers. Please stop settling and go get better shots. You're better off going towards the rim, trying to get fouled, and maybe missing than just chucking up three-pointers where you have no chance of getting a rebound because you're 20 feet from the basket. Something that we had talked about last week was, you know, the possibility of K-State trying to run it and play up tempo. Well, that wasn't really, you know, a possibility at all on Saturday with eight players. Um, so I'm, I'm totally with you. You know, those, you know, all those three pointers getting jacked up is not a recipe, you know, to win you any games, but it, at, at this point in the season, it's like, what, what do you do? You know, where do you go when you only have this number of players? Um, uh, real quick, I want to go back to what you you would ask Jay. Ahmad Wainwright, I was thinking about this for a few minutes, comes to my mind um, when you think about Dejuan Gordon. Yeah, he's much more of a role player, not a superstar, but hustled his tail off every play, you know, had those tip-ins, you know, got his team um, extra, you know, possession, stuff like that. He didn't shoot it as much. He wasn't as prominent as a player, but uh, Wainwright just came to my mind. I That's wanted good. to get, that, get that out there. That's really good. Um, let's talk about Davian Bradford now. Matt. Hang on, let's, hang on, let's I'm going to throw, throw this out just for grins and giggles. How about Dominic Sutton? Yeah. Yeah, not as uh, physical, I mean, but yeah. Dejuan was much better offensively than Dominic was, but Dominic was kind of the, the stopper. We'll see if Dejuan turns into that. that that's, that's the one that rattled in my brain. If, if yeah. Dejuan comes back, Jay, looking like Dominic Sutton next year, I'll be really happy. I'll never be more happy in my life <laughs> to see a guy with lots of muscles. Yeah, he. That, 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 that's a fair comparison. Um, I, I would agree. I think Dejuan has the potential to be a better shooter than than Dominique did for sure. Uh, but Gills, your comment about you know what do you do with eight players? To me, this accentuates even more so the need to get attack the rim and to run good offense and be efficient on it. Because like I said, if you have to grind for every basket on the offensive end, and then you have to go grind and play defense, you just have to appreciate that everything you do on the offense, it's like a, in a boxing match, you know, taking body shots. You're not going to get a knockout on a body shot, but you're going to wear him down. And, and the analogy is a basketball. If you attack the rim, Denny Clemente was perfect. The perfect example on this. He would put so much pressure on defenses that 
uh, you know, early on in the game, he'd get a quick couple fouls and maybe somebody gets out. But guess what? It seemed like every game we were in the one and one with like 12 minutes to go in the first half. And those are easy buckets then. Um, and, and so for a team that that's hard to score, you know, those are, those are ways that you can manufacture some baskets to, uh, to, to make it easier, particularly when you need it because you're shorthanded. And furthermore, your big guys can kind of take, take it off. If, if you see Denny ripping out down the court, you know, he's putting it up on, on the glass or at the rim. And if you're Lou Cologne, you're just standing back going, I'm watching you go ahead and do that. And that's just the way that is, but that's yeah, a really good point. Now back to Davion Bradford. He only plays 12 minutes in this game. He got two quick fouls and went out, but I, I continue to think that maybe now they're being too protective of him. How does he only play 12 minutes with two fouls and yet he didn't play because he was in foul trouble. I don't, quite grasp that but he's got to be better he's got to quit playing defense with his hands all bad habits big 12 officials have to let big guys play they get too touchy on that but matt sum up where davion is and and how these fouls are really holding him back and now i think the coaches are being a little bit too cautious with the foul trouble yeah i I would I would disagree with that and in, in that I think Saturday case it had to protect him a little bit and you know he couldn't get two fouls in five minutes and and then get pulled out so Bruce pulled him after the fir- first foul and I I think ultimately the maybe the tempo of the game wasn't great for Davion because of the athleticism of Oklahoma State um, you know I, again I think if Kansas State would have utilized a ton of shot clock, taking the air out of the basketball a little bit, slowed the game down, minimized possessions. And then maybe Davion winds up staying in the, staying in the contest for a lot longer, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be. And, you know, Kansas state's options were just so limited uh, in that ball game. But uh, yeah, I, I think he's grown immensely. And I think K-State's gotten a lot more out of him to this point in mid-January than they thought they would. Gills, K-State isn't going to win many games going forward in the short term here with four points and one rebound from Davion Bradford. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing is just getting him um, out of foul trouble. I don't know what that is. You know, I don't know if Jay has a, you know, an expert analysis on that, but I mean, just <laughs> you can't be fouling like that. I know he's young. I totally get that, but um, you know, Joe, I don't know if Petrakis plays as much as he does. If, you know, Bradford is able to play, you know, a full 30 minutes and, and everyone else is, you know, or just Bradford alone is, you know, playing his normal minutes. So that's something that's got to be fixed. It was the same story in the Texas tech game on the road where he had foul trouble. So that's not a recipe for success. Jay, give me your breakdown of Davion Bradford on the defensive end and how you would fix him. I think on the defensive end, particularly with young players, the game just moves so fast. Um, you know, you don't you don't understand angles. You don't understand where you're supposed to be, and and you you may understand it, but you've just spent the, the four years being able to to get there quickly, and and now everything moves a half step faster. When you when you're a half step slow, you're out of position. You're going to get a foul call on you, and that you, know, you see, we saw it a lot in the um, in where we see it a lot in teams, even with the starters, when, 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 when you're outmatched physically with teams, you know, everyone complains about, you know, officiating and things like that, particularly with K, KU, but some of those KU teams are just they're way more athletic and they just get to the spot first. And, and, and when you're half step slow, you're going to get a foul called on you. And so what Davion has to recognize is, you know, know which battles to fight. If, 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 you, if, if you, you don't be known as a shot blocker, if you can't block the shot, we need you on the floor. I'd rather have you give up a basket than get a cheap foul because you're out of position. And because he is a, a, a young kid and seven foot, he still doesn't have a great control of his body in, in a lot of ways that, that will come as, as he gets more mature. So when he gets in the air or he gets moving, it's hard for him to back off. And I think that that's going to be hard for him to do again, to remain aggressive but at the same time, too, not not put himself in positions where he's going to get cheap fouls called on him just because he's a step slow or a little bit out of position because teams are going to take advantage of that. They're going to drive into him. They're going to try and create contact knowing that they can get it. And I think Bruce is going to have to reevaluate his policy at times, too, about taking kids out with two fouls because, you know, 
I, I get it. I, you know, there, I see both sides of the argument completely on it. I'm not saying he should or he shouldn't, or it's a, it's a bad strategy, but it, moving forward, when you have this type of roster, I don't know that you can make that such a hard and fast rule as, as he traditionally has. Matt, I get it in the first half. I mean, he got the foul. He needed to come out. Um, but in that second half, uh, he should have been out there every minute he could be before he fouled out or just ran out of gas, which, you know, was happening to everyone. Uh, I, I don't know. I He's got a lot of things to fix in his game, but, boy, it's nice to have a guy that isn't outmanned when you go up against Kevin Samuel, or maybe we'll see. He's pretty athletic, but David McCormick from Kansas. Maybe he'll be able to give him some issues uh, with his size. Um, it's it's just so weird to talk about there. K-State basketball and a post player. It's just so weird. Yeah, he's going to get there. He's, uh, you know, Hard to win with freshmen. He's got a lot to learn. Uh, he just he needs to live in the gym, and you know Kansas State's going to be fine with him. I, you know, along with what Jay said, you know he's got to be careful on screens when he's asked to come set a screen out high, not stick your hip out, not stick your butt out, but plant your feet and and stay, you know, stay firm on those, and uh, you know just stay away from the cheap fouls. He has a tendency to, you know. Uh, on Saturday, there were a number of times where it was either Davion or, or Lingard who bought, you know, a head and shoulder fake and got off the floor. And, you know, when you're seven foot, you're practically touching the rafters. Uh, just just stay on the floor. So, again, he's getting there. And I, as I said, I still think to this point, K-State is getting so much more from him than they thought they were going to get. And um, he's – by the time all is said and done, he's going to be really, really good. Jay, I just want to point out something, and you have a point here also, but picking up fouls on a screen it is partly your fault, but it's also the fault of the guy going off the screen. Your big man sets up. Don't make him lean. Don't make him stick out a knee. Use the screen properly, for God's sakes. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's like you're reading my mind, you know, <laughs> What if we you want to keep Davian on the floor? His teammates can help him. Don't get beat off the dribble as much, and and the the guards being ready to pinch down and help on uh, dribble drive containment as well. So so those dribble drivers don't reach Davion as the last line of defense. You know, if Davion's out there, yes, Davion needs to stay still and everything, but at the same time too, wait on the screen, use it correctly. Don't leave him out there uh, in front of God and everyone where officials are going to call it because he wants to do a good job. He wants to set screen. He knows that that gets him into whatever they're trying to run. And so don't put him in positions where they're not, where, where he's going to fail in just because of he, there's no chance for success. So I think his teammates can do a lot too to help him with that. You know, if, if he's playing against, uh, you know, a, a post that, that that's giving them problems, you know, get good ball pressure. Don't let them just throw it into the post to where uh, they can attack him. But there's a lot of – K-State needs him on the floor on the offensive end in particular. I think they can get by on the defensive end. I don't think he's a special shot blocker yet or a game changer on the defensive end yet. He will be, I think, but he's not there yet. Um, but they need him offensively on, on the offensive side of the floor, and, and the other players need to do what they can do to help him keep stay on the floor. And again, going back to your earlier point, if you're not the guy who's supposed to guard the fast break, be on the offensive boards because the more guys that are there, the less attention they can pay to Davion Bradford. Or maybe they continue to pay attention to Davion Bradford and the ball is going to you instead. Gills, I want to I touch on something here. Kansas State picked up its second commitment in the 2021 recruiting class, so the second incoming freshman. This should fill up the scholarship count. We'll be curious to see if they keep going, because that's an indication that they're planning on someone not coming back, which I don't foresee right now with this team, but it happens all over the place. Give us your breakdown or a quick recap of who they just got, and, uh, and, and give us your thoughts on both the guys that are coming in for next year. So Maximus Edwards committed um, last night. Um, you know, we'll be we'll be honest and blunt here. He's not going to be a superstar for Kansas State at this point in you know the 2021 cycle. Um, you know, he's not going to be a superstar, but obviously the coaching staff sees something in him that they like. Um, out from New York, so you know Southwell with the connection there. 
Um, you know, that's, I think that's a good, a good area that Kansas state needs to get back into. And you think of guys like Southwell or Kirk Kelly, you know, some, someone out there from, um, the Northeast, it's good to get that back here at Kansas state. Um, and then also Logan Landers committed a couple months back. I think that he is going to be the, the primary man here in this recruiting class. Um, I think that it's going to be interesting to see moving forward. You've got Lingard, Bradford, Landers, and Eziegu moving forward at, you know, at the big spot. So that's going to be interesting to see how, how Weber can kind of handle that. But I mean, let's be real here. I think that the coaching staff is, is all in on this current freshman class um, obviously you're going to need players to keep your roster full, but, uh, when you've got Bruce Weber's best ever, uh, you know, rated recruiting class at Kansas state, um, you know, this is right now, this freshman class is the future. Um, sir, I'm not trying to say that, you know, Edwards or Landers are not going to be good players, but moving forward, I think they're, they're all in on this current, you know, group of young guys. I think they've got a true stretch for now. You know, the guy that can go out there and shoot and kind of be the Dean Wade role, which I think Bruce Weber really likes. Jay, I, I haven't talked to you about this, but I'm going to tap you to do some video breakdown on those two recruits. All right. Logan Landers is going to be a factor. You just wait. Yeah, I agree. I think he's really good. Matt, is, are the women are ever going to resume basketball activities? This is dragging Someday. On. They're Man. supposed to play... Sunday against Oklahoma State. We'll see if that happens. They've missed four games, um, so <laughs> we'll see. I'm, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't. Who knows? Who knows? Very good. That's it for this edition of the Powercat Insiders Podcast, brought to you by Blue Mark Energy. For Matt Walters, Ryan Gilbert, and Jay Heinrich, I'm Fitz, and we will talk to you next week. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked. Temperature set. Lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.